cartooning was a part of the political scene, I guess starting from the Civil War. There were some, uh, particularly after the Civil War, there were newspapers began to use uh, political cartoons from time to time, but they were not a regular feature of newspapers. And actually it was not until uh, really after World War II that uh, political cartoons really became a regular uh, feature of, uh, of the major newspapers. A guy named John Kennedy, uh, excellent uh, artist and caricaturist, began drawing cartoons on a regular basis for the Arkansas Democrat after World War II. And a guy named Bill Graham uh, began to draw cartoons for the Arkansas Gazette, the other uh, statewide newspaper. And I guess John Kennedy is the, the dean of, of political cartoonists in Arkansas. Certainly he's been at it longer than anybody else and is, as a matter of fact is, is still doing it. Kennedy, as I say, was an excellent artist and caricaturist, but he was a gentle cartoonist and more or less non-judgmental. But then along comes George Fisher in the 1960s and really in the 1970s when George Fisher begins to draw cartoons on a regular basis for the Arkansas Gazette. And Fisher was a different kind of cartoonist. Uh, he was not a gag artist. His cartoons had, uh, had meaning and he was a social critic and in fact I think George Fisher was probably the most influential social critic uh, of the last half of the, of the century. Uh, and he had a point of view and his cartoons reflected that powerful point of view. The metaphors that he drew I think captured the imagination of a lot of young people and uh, inspired a, a generation of, uh, of young cartoonists who have kind of spread across the country now, like John Deering, a uh, splendid cartoonist for the, uh, for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, uh, Vic Harville, Roger Harville, their names spelled slightly differently, uh, Dwayne Powell, who started out as a cartoonist for the uh, Pine Bluff commercial and then later did cartoons for newspapers in the East, but there were a lot, of, a lot of cartoonists who were inspired by George Fisher and his pen uh, back in the 70s and 80s. When George uh, was in, college, in, in high school, rather, uh, he drew his first cartoon. And that cartoon was, was of Homer Atkins. Um, his dad encouraged him to continue drawing. And uh, so even though, you know, at that time, I think trying to make a living as an artist or as a cartoonist in Arkansas wouldn't have been seen as a real common thing to do, his dad really encouraged him in that direction. He went into the Army in, in World War II. He was an infantryman, and uh, he was a Battle of the Bulge survivor. Uh, he carried a sketchbook with him all during the Battle of the Bulge and uh, made a lot of sketches, you know, in combat situations and, and uh, in the field. And it was during World War II that he met uh, Rosemary Beryl Snook, and that was uh, the lady that he would eventually marry, and, and that was the Snooky of his cartoons. Fisher had, had started drawing cartoons after World War II for a little newspaper at West Memphis, Arkansas, a little a raucous little newspaper, hell-raising paper, uh, and it went out of business. So he began to draw cartoons in the late 1960s. He started he drew cartoons for the North Little Rock Times, occasionally for the Pine Bluff Commercial. So in about 1972, uh, the, the Arkansas Gazette began to carry his cartoons twice a week. In 1975 or 76, uh, Fisher became its full-time uh, political cartoonist. Now the, the cartoons that I always considered and a lot of people considered uh, to be George's best work were on local issues because that's where he developed the icons and the metaphors and the symbols for various characters that really stuck and in some cases could break a politician in the way that Thomas Nast went after Boss Tweed in the late 19th century. I think Frank White munching on the banana with a button popping off of his shirt probably had a lot to do with Frank not getting reelected as governor. I guess the most famous Fisher cartoon, certainly the one that's reprinted most often, is a cartoon that he drew in January of uh, 1965. Orville Faubus had been elected to a sixth term, that was his last term in, as, as governor, and he was addressing the joint session of the House and Senate. And if you look across the scene of the House, every member of the House and Senate looks exactly like Orville Faubus, the same facial features as Orville Faubus, that same distinctive nose and mouth. And then if you look along the walls of the House chamber, you have all the portraits of 
of, uh, of great lawmakers of the past, and every one of them has the Orville Faubus features. And then the assembled dignitaries on the stage, men and women, all have the same Faubus features, even down to a little mouse peeping out, and the mouse has Orville Faubus's nose. And it was uh, something of a metaphor for the internal incumbent. That cartoon represented uh, the vast power that Orville Faubus had accumulated, unprecedented power in Arkansas history. George's cartoons um, became really well known, I think, in the in the late, uh, the mid to late 1970s, after he became the full-time cartoonist for the Gazette. Um, the word got out that this word Snooky was was appearing in his cartoons, and it would be hidden in the cross hatching or the shading. George did great line work in his cartoons, very intricate, you know, cross hatching. So the word Snooky would usually be camouflaged by a bunch of crisscross lines somewhere, uh, like maybe in the folds of a curtain or, uh, you know, on the trunk of a tree or or whatever. So what uh, what people found out was, of course, that. Snooky was, was the nickname of George's wife, Rosemary. And so it was a tribute to, to Rosemary. So it became a, a game with readers. And sometimes readers would, if, if they look for the cartoon, uh, the, rather for the, the name Snooky hidden in the cartoon, and they wouldn't find it, they'd, they'd call and they'd find out that he just had not put Snooky in the cartoon that day. They get really frustrated and angry, you know, because it, it was sort of like the uh, the daily crossword puzzle, where you, you try to find Snooky, and sometimes it was pretty obvious you could find it right away, and sometimes it took a while. Fisher drew more cartoons of Bill Clinton, I guess, than any other politician, probably more even than uh, than Orville Faubus. He was not exactly a fierce critic of Bill Clinton, but he loved to lampoon him, and his cartoons usually were. Um, an elaboration on a theme that Bill Clinton was immature when he took office. So the first cartoons of uh, Bill Clinton after he became governor, he was in a baby carriage, which represented his immaturity. But as he progressed and as he made wiser decisions in George Fisher's mind, he elevated him to a tricycle. And so Bill Clinton was always on a tricycle for a couple of years. Uh, and then gradually he elevated to a bicycle but with training wheels. And then eventually he progressed to a bicycle. And finally when he uh, goes to the White House, he's in an old stripped down pickup truck. Fisher uh, had a habit of, with every politician, finding something that would come to represent that person. With Frank White it was a banana. Uh, with David uh, Pryor it was a coon dog. In, in 1977, David Pryor had a plan to share state revenues with the cities and counties. He was telling people that voters back home could either decide to uh, levy taxes on themselves to support a better fire department, better police department, or they could just spend it on a new coon dog. Well, Fisher draws a cartoon then with David Pryor addressing the legislature with this coon dog holding up cue cards for the governor standing at the lectern addressing the legislature. And then that coon dog then became a fixture in every David Pryor cartoon that ever appeared again. That old coon dog was somewhere trotting along beside uh, the governor and later the senator. Uh, George died at his drawing board and he had just finished two cartoons uh, that, that he'd drawn for the Arkansas Times. So, you know, he went out like, like a true cartoonist at the drawing board, but he'd completed his deadline. He never syndicated his cartoons because if you syndicate your cartoons, you have to draw for a national audience. And he wanted to draw for, a, for an Arkansas audience. That was his passion, doing something about Arkansas. So, and I think he did. I think uh, that he was the sharpest social critic of his time. And as such, he made an immeasurable contribution to uh, political reforms in Arkansas that occurred in the 80s and 90s. I think. Bill Clinton and Dale Bumpers and all of those would agree that, that George Fisher's cartoons were extremely instrumental in helping them bring about some of the reforms that, that occurred during that time. And beyond that, uh, he was an inspiration to a whole generation of cartoonists. So uh, I think he was 
not only the greatest cartoonist we've ever had in Arkansas, but one of the most important figures in the 20th century in Arkansas. Thank you.